It's the radio guy, Mike Prince. Welcome to another Sunday night edition of the Mike Prince Show. Got a pretty interesting list for you on tonight. We'll hear from athletic director of the Grambling State Tigers, Dr. Rusty Ponton. We'll also be hearing from basketball analysts, other than Coach Van Petaway. A lot of things going on. Still wading through the coronavirus. Prairie View a University basketball signs eight. We'll be talking to Coach Byron Smith later on the next week to get his take on the new additions to the Prairie View A&M University men's basketball program. It's also going to be the landing of the new chief leading the path for the Prairie View A&M University Panthers. Dr. Donald Reed will be coming on board, taking his official position scheduled for July 15th. So much going on. Always a short time to get her done. How you guys doing on this Sunday evening? Hope that all is well with you and your loved ones, wherever you may be. Of course, we know the numbers keep rising with the coronavirus death total over 137,000. Over 3 million have been hit with the virus and the numbers are not declining. We'll see how all that goes out. UIL, the Interscholastical League of the state of Texas, they made a statement on last week talking about possibly flipping football to spring, which of course is what The power fives are talking about, and I'm on record for saying this. It makes sense for power fives to try to discuss that issue, or should I say possibility? But it does not make financial sense for FCS programs to be looking at that. It just doesn't. FBS has millions of dollars in TV revenue. So you can see why they would be doing the mad scramble, trying to make sure that they have some form of football to be played. It is not the case for FCS. And I'm not just talking about HBCUs. I'm talking about FCS as a whole. It's not that much money being made compared to that of FBS. So, therefore, the money that you would make, would it be worth what's at stake? And I think it's a clear no. We know that a lot of people have put emphasis on the Ivy League making the decision not to move forward. But before the Ivy League was Texas College, Houston Tillerson, Langston University, the SIAC, the CIAA, a lot of of big decisions that were made and now the trickle down that we're going to be seeing throughout the course of the weekend, a plethora of D2, D3 programs and some D1 programs have decided to say enough is enough. And don't look now, but Delaware State made a power move that many people are not truly focusing on. They acquired the purchase of a private school pretty close in proximity in Dover from Delaware State. And they picked up, I want to say it was, I think about a thousand extra students, property, but they had athletic programs. It's not sure on how they're going to keep the staffs. But what I'm looking at with Delaware State, staying to 
save the MEAC, if the truth be told, they making a power move that they want to be the new top dog. We'll see how all that unfolds, but it's going to be a very interesting story to watch. Now, it'll all become official. It's going to take about a year for all the red tape to be cleared, and they'll go ahead and move on down the road. But it is truly, truly a lot of things going on. We had some news about the state fair being canceled, not the state fair classic. We had Al Wash on, who was the promoter of the state fair classic game. We had him on with a news break this week, and we're going to hear from athletic director, Dr. Rusty Pontime, who's our scheduled first guest. And we're going to get him lined up right now as we take a break and get ready to hear what the good doctor has to say. So we'll take a break and we'll come back with more of the Sunday Night Live edition of the Mike Prince Show right here at the Open Mic Broadcast Network. Keep it where you got it. And we will be right back. You want answers? I think I'm entitled to You want answers! I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! I have a greater responsibility than you can possibly fathom. You don't want the truth because deep down in places you don't talk about at parties. You want me on that wall. You need me on that wall. Revelation won't be in, in the form of uh, when, when the first when the conversation first came up. Uh, but reparation for Dallas State, Jackson State, uh, all for, and, and, and the other HBCU coaches out there, you know what it would be? Let, let the state come through and, and pay those coaches like it's supposed to be. Whatever that state can do, whatever Arkansas Pam Luck coach and, and, and all foreign coach who uh, can't do for the coach, let the state chip in and do what they're supposed to do, all these states. Because it's just not Mississippi uh, that got, the, got in black in Mississippi and HPTUs uh, in Mississippi, they got the shoulder in the stick across the long length of time. It has been all of them that have gotten the short end of the stick. Whether they admit it or not, there's some challenges out there uh, on, on all the HBCUs. And now, have they done good? Yeah, they have done good. But have they done what, they, what they're capable of doing? No, they haven't. And they haven't because of the funding that they have been received. We'd like to recognize sponsors. Attorney Lee Van Richardson, located at 1047 Austin Street in Hempstead, Texas. Their phone number is 979-826-8008. Diva Skin Conditioner, located at divafeet.com, D-I-V-A-H feet.com. Their phone number, 903-270-0026. Prairie View Athletic Club, serving student athletes since 1986. Their phone number is 936-857-5817. Temple of Refuge Ministries, located in Prairie View, Texas, at 45372 Old Highway 290. Brazos Valley Schools Credit Union, several locations to serve you. Katy, Rosenberg, Brenham, Bryan, College Station, and Waller, Texas. Their phone number is toll-free, 855-391-391. 2149. If you or your business would like to be a part of the sponsorship team here at the Open Mic Broadcast Network, contact us at 832-213-8824. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Sunday Night Live, Mike Prince Show here from the Open Mic Broadcast Network. We are always looking for the next cutting edge interview and i think we got one lined up for you right now we are happy to bring back to the show the athletic director for the gramlin state tigers none other than dr rusty ponton and he told me this is the only time i can call him doctors when i first introduce him so rusty welcome back to the show sir Thanks a lot, Mike. We appreciate you having me back on. All right. Well, we're glad to have you back on. Uh, It was a lot of uncertainties at the beginning. People heard State Fair and they assumed that the State Fair Classic, which is the game between Gramlin and Prairie View on the fourth, third week, fourth week of September was automatically canceled. But Al Watts kind of cleared that up. Can you give us some to date information on what you've received since the news had broke about the state fair. 
Yes, yeah, so I'm first, but Al, Al has done a great job of keeping this game, this classic going. And Al had already brokered with the state fair that if, if the state fair did not uh, exist this year, if they did not open, that we would still be allowed to play the game if football was being played in the fall. So the game was never in jeopardy as far as the state fair is concerned. <laughs> concerned. So as of now, as I said, if football is going to be played in the fall, then we will be playing the game at the state at the Cotton Ball State Fair Classic. Okay, very good. So uh, all ears should hear that officially the game is still on, September 26th. So uh, don't hit the panic button just yet. But then on the flip side of that, numbers are not looking good across the nation, huh, Coach? No, not at all. I know here in the state of Louisiana, our governor has frozen us at phase two, which means that we cannot have organized physical contact as far as sports are concerned. Our numbers were, were spiking, and all of the games that we actually made up until the month of June were lost right after Memorial Day. So um, the governor is very, very serious about making sure that we do everything we possibly can to, to keep the social distancing, wearing the mask. As a matter of fact, he just mandated that all, all interactions outside of your home, you must have a mask on going into stores. Those individuals who work in stores and anyone outside must have a mask on. So... I applaud the governor for putting things in place like this, uh, Mike, because obviously we're just not getting it. I mean, the spread is continuous. Um, we have people who are getting sick and people who are dying. So um, if, under these current conditions, if we continue like we are going, it's going to be very, very difficult for us to be engaging in any kind of activity in the fall. You're absolutely right about that, which leads me right into my next question. We know uh, here in Texas, the UIL, which is the one that's the governing body for uh, high school athletics, they were talking about flipping uh, football or fall sports to spring, which I get that for kids trying to extend and, and get into college. I get that. FBS is talking about that. I get that because of the financial windfall that they could miss. But when it comes to FCS, and I'm not just talking about HBCUs, but FCS and even some group fives to a degree, would it be advantageous for them to consider playing spring football? Uh, I would say this, Mike, on a personal note, what we need is time. And when I say time, time for a cure, time for um, more studies on this, this pandemic. Right now, there are just too many uncertainties. There are just too many things out there, Mike, that could impair or, or actually put kids in danger. So under the current circumstances, if things got better really fast, really quick, I could see it. Um, but again, going back to what you were saying, I mean, a lot of people are looking at this issue, not just here in the States, but across the world. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm reading and, and, and looking at CNN and, and, and reviewing CDC regulations and, and new things every, every chance I get. So um, the way this pandemic is, is progressing now with the increase in increase in, in cases, Mike, it makes it extremely dismal for us to be doing anything in the fall. doesn't mean that it can't happen. It just We're just knowing that we're going to go with what, what the experts say is the safest thing for us to do. Absolutely. Absolutely. We're talking live right now with Dr. I'm sorry, I did it again. See, I got to give you the respect with, with <laughs> Rusty Ponton of the Grambling State Tigers. But here's something that I think people are missing, Rusty. If there is no sports, there are still going to be educational learning with the online avenues, correct? That is correct, Mike. Um, we actually here at Grammar State University, we have a hybrid um, class structure. Um, we actually going to be starting earlier, which will be in August, and actually finishing earlier, which, is the, which will be in November. And under that hybrid, hybrid um, philosophy, students will have the option of going to class are taking classes wholly online. Uh, and, and we have another piece that goes with that. For instance, if you have a Monday, Wednesday, Friday class and the class holds 30 students, then only 10 students would attend that class on Monday. 10 would attend the class on Wednesday. 10 would attend the class on Friday. That way we can ensure social distancing and, and minimize the amount of social contact that we have between students. Now, I think you may have heard about the, the lawsuit by, uh, by MC, MIT, and I think it's uh, UCLA, I'm not for sure, they actually put a lawsuit against the, the federal government because as of now, if you have classes that are not, if classes are wholly online, 
then all international students do not qualify to go to that school. They would either have to go back home if they're here in the States, or if they're out of, out of the country, they would not be able to come in the country. And this could be a huge, huge problem for a lot of students. So those schools that have, um, I, I think it was Harvard, those schools that have actually went out first and said that they're going to do strictly online or having to fight with the federal government now, Homeland Security now, as far as allowing those students to take those classes online. And they have a huge contingency of international students. Man, it seems like the more we learn, the deeper this thing gets, huh? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You know, and and we're not going to make this a, a political conversation. This is about a survival conversation as far as I'm concerned. But I think that people need to know that the, the learning aspect of it is still going to be in place for those who are seeking a higher education. Now, let me ask you this, Rusty, um, and, and this is, I guess, the silver bullet. There are institutions that have been facing some penalties, post ban play, this, that, and the other. Do you, as the athletic director, know or understand that if there is no fall sports and teams that had post ban, um, uh, postseason bans during fall, will that roll over to 2021 or will it go as time served? Well, I can say this, Mike. I have not personally had any information. Or I'm not privy to any, any information any information concerning whether or not those schools who have postseason bans, whether or not they will be rolled over or whether or not they will be used as time served. So I couldn't answer that question. I just know that the NCAA has a huge burden right now. There are a lot of things. But every one thing you think you can think of, uh, Mike, there's probably 10 or 15 things that are going to fall right behind it as far as extending kids' eligibility, um, paying for these scholarships. Uh, uh, extending extending competitions and championships and deleting games. Imagine the number of contracts that have been signed up until this point. Us, for, for instance, you know, we have contracts that were signed for the fall semester, uh, um, totaling $1.1 million as far as football is concerned. That goes away if you don't play. Uh, and I think you and I talked about this once before when we talked about the importance of financially, but at the same time, what's more important? What's more important are these student athletes and these students that we're going to be dealing with on a day to day basis. There's no revenue, there's no contract, there's no windfall or game guarantee that outweighs the value of our students. Absolutely. Now, in some cases, aren't there insurance policies that you could take out on these guarantee games in case there is a quote unquote act of God? That was that was prior to COVID. You know, uh, right now we're still trying to get COVID as an act of God. Which go figure, right? <laughs> hmm. I mean, so um, yes, there were were situations that you you have um, you, you had insurance prior to this, but in this particular case, prior to March, Mike, who would have thought that? Okay, you'd have something a pandemic of this nature that would totally just decimate the whole the whole system. Yes, sir. No doubt about it. Now, I'm going to try to be as optimistic as I can, Rusty, and look at this as the glass half full. If there is, you know, no sports on the flip side, you have a golden opportunity for your entire athletic department to get ahead academically for those kids who may have been on the bubble, those kids who may have just been flat out struggling for them to get back accelerated in the classroom part of it. And then with some type of of working out, I know it's not going to be as intense as you would if you were able to compete, but they can come back with a fresh mind, fresh set of eyes on things and possibly expand uh, some greatness in these athletic departments. Most definitely, Mike. I think that, you know, we have to refocus and re- and re- and realize the fact that, hey, look, they come to get an education, you know, and we know more than anyone as far as HBCU is concerned, HBCU is concerned that that's your primary reason for being in, in school, which is why we are so, I guess, adamant about the safety of our, of our student athletes. Um, I was asked the question, well, will you play the games in a, with an empty stadium? You know, we talked about that, Mike. That doesn't benefit us to play a game in front of an empty stadium. At the same time, it doesn't benefit us also to have people who support us put in danger either. So we 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 are we're under the mindset that okay, hey, we have something in place now that we can't control. We have no control over this time, but what you do have control over is making sure you be the best possible student that you can, getting yourself mentally and emotionally ready to go when it when it is time to go, that you'll be ready to go. So 
that's making sure that we're straight on and off the field. Absolutely. You know, I'm I'm just going to try to add a little sidebar uh, humor, not in that kind of way, but just you know, it'll make sense. Maybe this was a conspiracy by the FBS because they want to do their own thing anyway. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so it's a, because it's really it's, it's us and them. That's what it is. It's, it's FBS and everybody else because it's dog eat dog. Even with FBS, they're like, well, we got a couple of screws that can't make it. We'll just keep it and lead them to the side too. Hey, you know what? You you might have some that, Mike. I don't think you'd have to go too far, <laughs> so, uh, too much of a stretch. Uh, I mean, I know FCS, especially schools, um, even even mid major schools, they're going to be suffering. I mean, a lot because much like us, but they depend upon those guarantee games a lot Absolutely. also, and, Absolutely. They, and they were getting you know two or three times what we were getting for those games. So that's going to impact their budget. You know, I was telling someone on the expo, what are you guys going to do? I said, we're going to do as we have always done. We're going to survive. We're going to make it. We're going to find <laughs> a way to make it. You, you won't see us jumping off the roof. <laughs> hey, man. Hey, I, this <laughs> is, <laughs> I'll never forget my baby girl. She'll be 19 in September. And I remember when my wife told me that she was pregnant with her and I, I was in shock, and I sat down at the edge of the bed. I said, Lord, how are we going to feed another mile? He said, you're going to do what you've been doing. You're going to cut that <laughs> cornbread another slice thinner and, <laughs> and spread them beans out just a little bit more, and everybody's going to eat. So that's what you yeah, do. <laughs> that's what we do, Mike. Right? That's what we do. One thing, one thing about us at these HBCUs, our HBCUs, we know how to stretch something now. So, yeah, we've, we've made do with nothing for so long to the point that, you know, you'd be like, okay, this is another year. we got to make do with nothing. Absolutely. We're talking with Rusty Ponton, athletic director of the Grambling State Tigers. Now, Rusty, I got, a, a, I guess, a more serious concern, and I don't know if you guys had even been able to address this, but what about the mental health of not only the student athletes, but the coaches and the staff as far as all this going on? Have you guys been able to address that as far as even seeking out to get these guys some type of help? Mike, you know, I'm so glad you brought that up, Mike. We have, that's something, you know, when you start thinking about the fact that we have young men and women, and, and as well as our coaches, who are going back to, or who are in situations where they have five or six people in a two-bedroom, you know, these kids have, the college is basically their respite. You know, they're able to sleep in their own bed, have some space, and, and that kind of thing. But when you're worried about whether or not, you know, whether or not your family can even survive through this or worrying about when you, when you have a, a member who gets sick and what that does to the family unit. And as far as our coaches know, coaches love their players. You know, coaches love their players. And you, you, you're you calling them our coaches, I know. And I know most coaches are doing that. They're doing weekly calls, Zoom calls, not to talk about uh, are you working out or, or talk about uh, uh, athletics. We've employed our coaches and our coaches are co- reaching out to our student athletes that how are you doing? How's Mama doing? How's Papa doing? You know, are you guys doing okay? You know, how's if you had a sick family member? Imagine the number of people who've been affected by this disease, by this pandemic, uh, this virus. I mean, imagine people who've died. I know people who've died, and it's like now they've estimated that one in one in four individuals would have somebody impacted by COVID, whether yes, either sir. Yes, di- sir. directly having the the, the the virus or or someone died from the virus. So this is like life, and it's kind of sad, uh, Mike, when you start, we start, I don't want to say trivializing, but we get numb to the fact that you start seeing these numbers and we just see them as numbers. But, I mean, I've literally, Mike, literally watched some of the some of the broadcasts at night and you see these numbers pop up and you get, you know, you, you, your heart get heavy and tears roll down your eyes because, yes, sir. you know, if you've experienced death at all, yes, death sir. at all, then you realize that 130, over 135,000 people have lost their lives. Yes, sir. That's just in our country. Yes, sir. So um, you start I, thinking about how, how heavy that is on kids and, and, and parents and worrying about their kids. It's a lot of mental health that goes in there. So we, we, we are actually open. We have telemental mental health. We, we, we call our kids. We check on them. We call the coaches. I just do a, a mental health check, an emotional health check on our coaches. Hey, guys, how are you doing? What you doing? You know, that kind of thing. So. Absolutely, man. I lost a friend of mine this week to the virus and – no four people personally who are struggling with this thing. So it is real as real can get. We're talking again with Rusty Ponton, athletic director of the Grambling State Tigers. Now, Rusty, have you had any calls or concerns from parents on not wanting their kids to return back? Well, we have calls just about every day. 
we have called it. And, and let's be honest, kids want to play. These our, our kids, this kids in, in general, they they see this virus, but you know they're invincible right now. They're supermen, superwomen, you know. So they and so we are educated. We actually started a series, an educational series on COVID nineteen for our student athletes, where the trainers reach out to them on a weekly basis and they give them updates and education. Um, they're educating our coaches. They're ed- educating our staff, you know, on on the complexities of this of this of this virus and on actually the things that you need to do to make sure to make sure that you, you know, you, you minimize, you minimize what um, your exposure. So with that in mind, like we parents are concerned and rightfully so, you know, they're concerned, they're worried. Can you keep my child safe? You know, what's going to happen? You know, those kind of things. Some of the questions, you know, we tell them just all right. We don't have the answers to, we don't, we don't have the answer to when we're going to start. We don't have the answer to when we're going to actually, uh, uh, this, 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 this virus will be over. Uh, we'll be able to do the things, uh, return back to some normalcy. It's just not there. Those are questions we can't answer. But what we have told them is this. We're going to do everything humanly possible to make sure that we don't put your child or anyone in danger as far as athletics is concerned. Well, We're going to minimize or mitigate it as much as possible. That is the absolute best thing that you can do, my friend, and say. And it's one of those that... I wouldn't want to be in your shoes right about now. So um, you guys keep doing all you can while you can. And um, I, I appreciate you coming on, man, helping bring some clarity to the situations that are going on. And, you know, since you are the top man in the athletic department at GSU, I'm going to give you some 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 closing thoughts and comments, you know, and I'm going to save mine for when you get done. How about that? That sounds good, Mike. Well, well, first, Mike, I just want to thank you guys. Um, thank you guys for what you're doing because there's so much misinformation out there. There's so many things. You know, we, like you said, we don't want to politicize this thing, but when you have um, um, government officials not wearing masks, not showing, you know, and it kind of basically what I'm saying, leading, leading the, the sheep to the slaughter, so to speak, when we, when we are trying everything that we possibly can to make sure that we let people know how serious this pandemic is, how serious this virus is, and what you need to do in order to protect yourself. So th- we, we appreciate what you guys are doing because you are out here. You are our voices. You know, we, we can't reach everyone just in the confines of our own circles as far as the universe is concerned. And we know you're listening, you're listening viewers out there. So we need them to make sure that they pray for us. That's one thing. Continue to support our institutions. But in every way you possibly can, financially, uh, reaching out, just, just helping kids in your area, making sure those kids, making a call, something as simple as that. We just want to, we just want individuals to know that as institutions, we, what we were built on, we're still here for. And that's to make sure that we give every young man and woman an opportunity to get an education. If they have the ability to play sport, if they have the ability to, to exercise those rights on the field, or on the court, then we enhance those things and put them in situations to be successful. So with that said, you know, we want to keep our kids safe. We want to continue to work hard, do the things that we need to do to make sure that they're okay. And just basically just be be the the, the institutions that we were, we were meant to be. I couldn't have said it better myself, Rusty. Thank you so much, man. And we're going to keep our eyes, ears, and toes crossed because you know me being a PV guy and all. <laughs> I've got to be able to see that <laughs> PV Grambling game. It's been a long time, but right now I like where we're standing right now, brother. And I truly, truly appreciate you joining us on tonight. Don't be a stranger. We're going to keep in contact. You stay safe, man. Take care of the wife and the kiddos, and we'll talk to you real soon. All right, my man? Thanks, thanks, Mike. Stay safe, man, and God bless. All right, God bless. That was Dr. Rusty Ponton of the Gramlin State Tigers. We are going to take us a break. We got Coach Van Petaway in route to be with us real soon you listen to the mike prince show live on the open mic broadcast network keep it right where you got it and we will be right back i guarantee you It's the Open Mic Tele-Network line. Dial 720-721-1558. 
And instantly at your fingertips, you have the latest local news, weather, and sports. Need a word of encouragement? Dial 720-721-1558. The Open Mic Tele-Network line features weekly prayer, verse of the week, and local ministries at your fingertips. Everything you need on demand. Dial 720-721-1558. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. No internet, no problem. No Wi-Fi, no problem. No app, no problem. All you need to do is dial 720-721-1558 to listen now. Hello, this is Alonzo Hardy Jr., the president of the SWAC Alumni Association. The SWAC Alumni Association is an organization founded on December 10, 1999, at the Sheraton Hotel in Birmingham, Alabama. Its mission is to serve as a rallying ground for individuals who have made the Southwestern Athletic Conference the illustrious conference that it is today. Its membership is open to former student athletes who played in the conference in any sport, as well as to coaches, athletic administrators, staff members, game officials, and fans. Annually, the association holds a Legends Awards and Roast Banquet or Luncheon where it honors individuals with Lifetime Achievement Awards, a Chuck Prophet Wacken Master Award, and occasionally a Distinguished Service Award. Proceeds from that event help to finance degree completion scholarships for student athletes who have exhausted their playing eligibility at SWAC universities, but who may still need an extra semester or two to complete their college studies. For more information on the SWAC Alumni Association or to get information on becoming a member, you can send correspondence to SWAC Alumni Association, 875 Miller Creek Lane, Newport News, Virginia, 23602. The email address is SWAC Alumni Association at yahoo.com. And welcome back to the Mike Prince Sunday Night Live Show here at the Open Mic Broadcast Network, Dr. Rusty. Ponton joined us on the first segment. A lot of good information. And that's what it's about, man, being informed where you can make informed decisions. This next guest of ours, what can I say? He's just one bad dude. I should have played some Shaft. That's what I should. Now, I'm going to have to get some Shaft music and get it in. We're going to present to some and introduce to others. A bad mother, watch your mouth, Coach Pedaway. How you doing, Coach? Hey, I'm doing fine, Dr. Prince. How you doing today, man? Man, look, I am doing great, man. I got the basketball guru himself on the line with us. And let me first, before we say anything, let I'm going to let you know how much we appreciate you and what you bring, how the listeners that are connected to the Carlos Brown Show, the Mike Prince Show, and this network appreciate uh, your truthfulness, your, your love for the game, your passion for this conference, and it's just an absolute joy, thrill, and honor to know that you're on this. We're on the same team as a coach, Petaway. Well, well, I, well, I thank you for that, uh, Mike. But look, man, the, the thing, the thing is that you all are the ones that are bringing it to the public. Uh, you know, we, we're just individual. I'm just an individual, and I just, I'm just speaking my mind. I'm speaking it through experience and the, the things that I've seen through in my uh, career uh, in athletics uh, from being a basketball coach to an athletic director, that kind of thing. So, uh, you know, just to share what I know and what I have seen, I, I think uh, I think we all have a responsibility or a job to pass it on. And so if we can pass on anything that's helpful for anybody, then so be it. Well, absolutely. And with that being said, and you just walked right into this first question, man, with the experience that you're bringing, uh, we we uh, heard, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, my Panthers then loaded up again. Coach Smith signed eight guys, man, and we're going to have him on later on through the week uh, talking about those eight guys. But as you sit from your chair now, how would you identify the state of basketball right now in the collegiate world? Well, I, it, it's in the influx because of the virus. You know, prior to the virus, I thought we were headed in, in a great, uh, we were headed in the great in the right direction, uh, particularly in the SWAC. Uh, I thought we were headed to a showdown between Prairie View and and, and uh, Southern. 
because they were by my estimation were the two best teams in in the, the SWAC basketball. But with the virus rearing its ugly head, you no, know, it's thrown everything into a a, a flux, an influx, and no one really knows what's going to happen because there are too many unknowns about the virus itself. It is it has affected so many lives. And there are so many unknowns that are out there. See, we everybody's, you know, worried about the physical things that, that are not happening. You know, whether or not we're going to have sports and that kind of thing. They better be trying to figure out what are the long-term effects of the virus itself on our bodies for those that have contracted it and those uh, who have an opportunity, who may have an opportunity to, to end up with the virus too. What, what are the long-term effects of this? And then what about the mental aspect of it? You know, that there are people, you know, the, when, you, when you talk to the health providers and people like this, they're, they're talking about all the stress that this virus has put on different families. And, and you know, it'll affect us more than the other people. Yes, sir. Uh, you know, it's already shown that. But because of our, our family situations, it's going to affect us more. Because most of the times, there are more of us in smaller spaces than the others. Mm-hmm. And and it's just a big thing to deal with. Yes, sir. So so you you got people worried about the financial side of it. Then at the same time they worried about their health, their physical health, and then there's also the mental health side of it. So it, it's a lot of it's a lot of moving pieces to this thing. So basketball in itself, no one can tell you what it, what it's like because you, you're not having your kids on campus. Their rhythm was broken when when they ended the season, where where people couldn't even finish their car in some cases. They weren't able to even finish their conference seasons. So now you haven't had your kids since March. So that's that's tough. That's tough. Absolutely. So it's like starting from scratch now. Yes, sir. Everybody's building a program, which in in my view of cer- certain things, and, and I want to ask you this question, we're seeing a lot of transfers, and, you know, the transfer portal has been the hotbed. But for some reason, in my gut, and maybe it's because the corona and things have not been in the rhythm, as you just mentioned. I'm excited, but not overly excited about some of the commits I'm seeing, some of the transfers I'm seeing, because I'm going like, A, will they ever come to fruition? And then B, what it's going to look like with so much time off. Are you understanding what I'm saying about that, Coach? Right. That, that's what I'm saying. And, and that's my point also. Because there's been so much, there's been such a long gap in between coaches having their hands on the actual pr- players. No one knows what, what they're going to see. Be- because now you got to rely on each one of your kids to have that commitment to keep doing the things that you've taught them. That's for your returning players. And then for your new kids, all they can do is, is, is stuff virtual. They, they're not even used to your program. They're not even used to you. You know, it, it, it's one thing sitting up in front of a computer uh, trying to learn uh, how to take care of your body and to do things, but it's, some, it's something totally different when that coach has that whistle in his mouth and you hear his voice and his reaction to things that you're doing. So that, you know, that's two totally different things. And because of the fact that they don't have the kids on campus, especially at the HBCUs, uh, these kids aren't even on campus. Right. So these coaches really don't have – any kind of idea of what's going on. Well, you know, you just brought up something when you had said the whistle in the mouth. I believe it was a school district in Florida. I'm not real sure what state, but they have over 400 uh, street crosses for the elementary schools, and they're replacing the whistles because they have to have the mask on, and now they got these little devices that sound like whistles. Are we seeing that it's going to be part of the gym gear now for coaches in the future? See, you don't even you, we don't know that. Well, you know, like right now, okay, you got the TBT going on right as we speak. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know that that and they isolated up in up in Dayton, and they're playing the tournament. The officials don't have masks on. They're blowing the whistles. Uh, the, you know, these guys have been in quarantine, and 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 they have put uh, measures in place to keep everybody safe. Their championship game will be on Tuesday, Tuesday night, but. They're, the officials that are doing the games now, they got whistles in their mouths. So I'm quite sure that the coaches, 
when they're practicing their teams, they're doing the same thing. But wow. everybody's in a bubble, and it's in the same environment. And they're doing test after test to make sure that these kids aren't infected. But here's the thing, or these, young, these men in this case, because these are grown men that are playing this game, but on our level, and, and particularly the HBCU, I really do not see us having the finances to keep our kids safe. I, I'm just being honest. I, 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 don't see, I don't know of a school out there that can truthfully say that they can do everything that needs to be done to keep these kids safe. And I think the thing, I think we need to err on the side of caution. Let's delay the start of these fall sports until we get a, a better understanding of how this virus works. Absolutely. And, that, and that's, that's where it's, whether it's football or basketball. I just don't see how football can start up. Now, basketball, I, I can see that because you don't have to start until later into the year. Right. Right. Because if they can wait until January and just do conference schedules, that's doable. But to say the kids need to be reporting to campus in a couple of weeks, I just don't see that. Right. Not, a, not on the HBCU level. Well, I, not even just HBCU. FCS as a whole, I was just talking with uh, Rusty Ponton, and the ones that are really pushing this, of course, is FBS because they have the more to lose than right. any of the other uh, institutions involved with this particular movement. And it, it made me think, Coach, and you might appreciate this because you're, you're uh, as I say, you're a freelancer. You can say what you want to say. You say, I got my retirement money. They can't take nothing else from me, right? So, right, correct. <laughs> when you look at this thing, I'm saying, this is just Mike Prince theorists or conspiracists, however you want to call it, I think that the NCAA, they have more to gain from basketball because, A, they have more control of it, and they have all schools that are involved when it comes to championship potential. Football is a bit different structure because FBS has been wanting to do their own thing for quite some time, and now it appears that this is the time that they'll finally sever ties and then the FCS and those who remain will have to regroup under some new structure for the NCAA. Does that seem far-fetched? No, not at all, because, Mike, this is what a lot of people don't know. The NCAA is being ran off of the basketball revenue. Yes, sir. A lot of people don't know this, but football, that money that you get in them bowl games, that doesn't come back to the NCAA. That's divided up amongst those conference schools. Right. The schools that participate in that in their conference, they get the the bulk of that money. But whereas the the TV deal for basketball, that seven billion dollars that they got for 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 the basketball tournament, uh -huh. that's the money that the NC two A uses to to run the NC two A and all these institutions. That's the money that everybody gets a piece of the pie. Yes, you get sir. a piece of that pie, but you don't get a piece of the bowl revenue. Right. Every school doesn't get that. Right. And and. So, Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm, sorry. I'm sorry. No, you go ahead. Right here, Coach. Go right here. No, no. What I'm saying is, so I can, I see your point. I know your point. See, I've known, I've known all along that that's how it was structured. That basketball is the one, it, basketball puts the money that funds the NC2A. That's their biggest money maker of uh, that basketball tournament. Well, let me ask you this. If the Power Fives have their way and they create their own island and the NCAA restructures and regroup can you see a changing of the guard as far as who gets to be the eye candy for the ncaa yes i do i i can see that i can see that happening wow. i can see it happening okay okay now to me the one who's caught up in no man's land are the group five institutions because they're on that bubble the right. power five really don't want you, and you think right. you you think you too good for FCS. And I have an old saying for that, Coach: When big don't want you, and little <laughs> can't use you, where did you go? <laughs> hey, you out there by your lonesome? Yeah, and that's exactly what's going to happen. Well, <laughs> if, if the power five has their own way, what do you see happening to the group of fives? Well, they're going to try to become the big dogs. That's what's going to happen. Once the Power Five leaves, 
then they're going to try to flex their muscles. But I don't, I don't know if that's going to work. But, but in spite of all of this, I've always said I, I would like for the HBCU conferences mm -hmm. to form their own thing, to form their own division. Okay. And play, play amongst themselves. Now you got to go out, you got to get uh, television revenue. You, you got to go out and get these big contracts, but I think it is doable because now you get to play uh, the teams that aren't in the power five. They need people on their schedules. They, they will have money. They got more money than any of us have right now anyway. Okay. And, and so you have a better chance of beating them than you do the power five schools. Okay, and I can imagine that the paydays wouldn't be as large as they would uh, been accustomed to, and and would they consider it's not even worth the game? Well, no, no, no. They're gonna need the games now. They'll need the games. They'll, trust me. They all. <laughs> there will always be a place for the HBCUs. See, we're we're their whipping boys. They 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 have to fatten their schedules up off of us because they know that. That's the way we fund our athletic programs. Uh -huh. We in basketball, we have to go out and play these games so that our respective universities can have this money coming in, this big influx of money, because they're not going to put the football teams out there. See, <clears throat> you you don't see too many of our uh, FCS football teams playing more than one uh, power five uh, power power five school per year. You're okay. not going to see more than one. But look how many we play in basketball. Right. See, see so, so now <clears throat> we can continue doing some of that, but on a smaller scale. They will need us to, to fulfill their home games. You know, to sell those season ticket packages, they got to get the 18 uh, from 16 to 18 home games. The only way they're going to get that, they have to bring in schools like us. Okay. Who have to sacrifice our, our – seasons to get uh to get that money for our universities okay so do you play hardball to get a little bit increase of that payday absolutely okay. absolutely okay. you hold out to get as much as you can and the closer it gets to the uh to the school year beginning the higher that money will be because <laughs> they, they, they have no i'm serious we we play that scheduling game i've uh -huh. done it before okay yeah if, if you hold out You'll get that money because there are certain dates they got the field. Okay. They got the field and they will give you that money. So you in, know that, that's why, see, what a lot of people don't know, you can get up to $100,000 for one basketball game. Oh, really? Yes. Okay. Give me, a, give me a scenario of what institution would be willing to pay that much and what would it take well, to lay I'll that I'll tell out. you one that tried to do it to me. The University of Connecticut, they called me and I told them they lost their mind. Cause I wasn't going to Connecticut. So they called my athletic director and guess what? He mm. comes running down to my office and said, man, we got this. We got uh Connecticut is willing to, to, to play us and, uh, and, and we'll get a hundred thousand dollars. I said, well, no, they want me on a Tuesday. I'm already playing on Monday. And he asked me, well, you don't think we can do both? I said, heck no. <laughs> I said, I wouldn't do that to my team. That ain't what and you I said, didn't. Coach. That ain't what you said. <laughs> yeah, you doggone right. You doggone right. That's not what I said. But now, during the time, I'm going to tell you who took that. Texas Southern. Okay. Texas Southern took that game, and they went up there and got beat by, I think, 60 or 70 points. Wow. Yeah, now, so see, you don't, you don't do that because Texas Southern was in the same scenario, had the same scenario. Those mm -hmm. kids had to travel on game day, play that game. They didn't have time to prepare anything. Okay, just show up. That day. Just, right. a, just a glorified exhibition game. Right. Sacrificial lamb. And okay. that's a true story. Now, that's a true story. Now, there's old, brings old dominoes saying all money ain't good money. Sometimes you got to pass on it. Thank okay. You. Now, with that 100000 Coach, does that include covering your airfare, room and board meals, or is that a separate deal? No. you can, Depending on the school, you can ask for that. The 100000 can go just straight to the school depending on how desperate they are for that game. Okay, okay. Yeah, but 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 sometimes you can say, okay, you're giving me the hundred thousand. Out of this hundred thousand, you all pay for my tickets, you pay for my rooms, you pay for my food. Then you send the university the remaining 
of that hundred thousand. But I've got it to where <clears throat> I can get eighty or ninety thousand, and they still give me rooms and food and, and uh, airfare. Okay, and with a basketball uh, travel, basketball team traveling, it's not as many rooms that you would need to comp for that or cover for that call. So I can I can actually see that being a a, a strong possibility of making that happen. Okay, like, I, like with me, my travel party was twenty six. Because I had TV and well, TV and radio, and when I say TV, I had a coaches show, uh-huh. so I had to have I had to have them to send a professional cameraman with me to get footage for the for the weekly coaches show, okay. and then we all we always did our radio show. So my travel party was twenty six every time I moved. So I so my party was twenty six, and the minimum I would accept would be sixteen rooms. Okay. Lay it yep. out there, Coach. You you might be helping a young coach right now or even an AD right now that's checking things out, how they can make a little bit more money with right, what's coming right. down the road. Mm-hmm. That's why we love you, Coach. That's why we right. love you. And see that, and they pay for that, so it does that. So my institution, Alabama A&M, they didn't have to pay <clears throat> for me to go to these games. Okay. okay. If I was able to get it in the contract. <clears throat> but now you're not, Dr. Prince, don't get me wrong now. You're not going to get that in every contract. Uh-huh. Well, that's why they call it negotiations, coach. Correct, correct, correct. Every school, see, you got some schools like back in the day, you knew not to mess with the Sun Belt. They're going to lowball you all day long. Okay, okay. Sun Belt was not going to pay. If you wanted money, you had go, You got to go to the SEC, you got to go to the ACC, you got to go to the Big 12, Pac. Well, I never went out to the Pac uh, 10. I didn't want to go out that far out. Uh-huh. It, was, it was Pac 10 when I coached. So, it, the the conf, Big Ten, Big Ten paid. Okay. They paid. Okay. You you can get just about anything you want, especially if they pick the date. And what like if, you, if 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 they wanted you for opening day, if mm-hmm. they want you for opening day, uh, the day before Thanksgiving or the day after Thanksgiving, you can get paid. Okay. Now what if what if you did like a regional schedule? What what's the maximum that you could get staying in the regional? Area. fifty to sixty. Okay, fifty to sixty thousand. Yeah, you 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 going down now? The the lower you go on the the, the structure in terms of the the conferences, the lower the money is. Right, right, right. Yeah. And so now, if you're dealing with a bunch of FCS schools in football, they're not paying big money in basketball. Okay, okay, I got you. I got you. Mm-hmm. We're talking with Coach Van Petaway, basketball analyst to the network um, for the Carlos Brown Show and, of course, the Mike Prince Show, Open Mic Broadcast Network, just a basketball ambassador. And, and with that being said, um, there is a tournament that you're personally directed or connected to um, that some caught wind of and, and, and some might not be, and that's the CIT. Coach, with the time we have left here, uh, break that down, uh, the the how and the what of the CIT and how it came to be. Well, the uh, College Insider has been going for about 15 years. A young man by the name of Joe Dwyer. This was his invention. He, he, he thought that uh, the mid-major schools did not get enough publicity. Uh, the the uh, HBCU schools did not get enough uh, recognition. So this man started a, a uh, tournament, that postseason tournament, that gave schools that did not make the big dance, the, the 64 or 68 now, didn't make the NIT, an opportunity to continue their seasons. And in doing this, he recognized three of the, the greats in college basketball, all from HBCU. First of all, John McClennan, he was one of the, the winning is black college coaches ever. Uh, he was one of the first to do a professional team. Then you had Big House Gangs, and then you had Ben Joe. Now, these are the three guys that he targeted, and by, by me saying targeted, he made awards in their names that went to top college basketball coaches at the end of the year. And at the same time, he invented the John McClendon Classic where he tried to pit uh, HBCU school 
against another school every year. Now, he's been doing this on his own. Uh, he, I mean, he's got a staff. And what he did, he called around the country and asked different coaches to serve on committees. Like, I, I was one of the guys, the regional guys for the South, and I did uh, – we would have a weekly uh, poll, and we would rank the mid-major schools. Now, under mid-major, that included the HBCU schools. So I would r- help him rank or uh, come up with a top 20 at one time. Then it went to top 25 schools for each year. I mean, each week of the basketball season for mid-majors. And in order to do that, I had to, you know, know a little bit about some of those teams. And so it, it was a learning experience for me. And I'm on the selection committee uh, for the CIT. And my job is to identify teams that I think are worthy of being in this tournament. And we extend them invitations. And in the SWAC, Grambling, uh, Jackson State, uh, Alabama State, uh, these are just some of the schools, and there are more than that, that, that have participated Texas in the CIT. Uh, yeah, I know Texas Southern. I, I, I extended an invitation uh, uh, to coach down in Birmingham the last time we played there. So uh, my job is to identify schools, and I, I do the MEAC and, and the SI, I mean, uh, the, uh, the SWAC. I identify schools that I think uh, deserve to be in the tournament. And I and we can we have a committee. I'm not the only person on it. Now there, there's a regional committee, and we discuss, and you fight for your schools and your teams. And uh, Joe extends the invitation, and they get a chance to play. Jackson State, my first year, uh, inviting them. I think they won two or three games in the in the tournament. Okay. Uh, you know they, we were in the SWAC uh, press conference. They had just lost a tough game. Uh, they were in the SWAC championship. And uh, Joe and I knew, I told him before I even got down to Birmingham that they had a great team. Uh, uh, Coach Brent was doing a great job, and I felt like that they, they could compete. And they accepted the invitation. Well, we extended the invitation while the kids were up on the stage crying because they thought their season was over with. <laughs> and then uh, so we were able to give them some good news that if their athletic director accepted, they had an invite to the CIT. And they went out and won their first two games in that tournament. I think they ended up losing out at uh, Grand Canyon, if I remember correctly. Okay. But, but it's, been, it's been great. Uh, Gramlin has been in it. And uh, it, it's a great sounding board. And not only do they recognize teams, they recognize coaches. You know, they, over the years, uh, Joe has picked coaches of the year for each black conference. Uh, okay. In fact, I, he, they, they picked me one year uh, as the uh, SWAC coach of the year. And so they they uh they do a lot for college bat. Joe does a lot for college basketball, and he is one of the first people that I've ever met that always from day one he included the little guy, and he considers mid majors as little guys. They're not part of the Power Five. Very now good. they do now. He also he does recognize the the, the uh the, some Power Five coaches, but he's the only person that I am aware of. That includes HBCUs and everything that he does. You got the Ben Job Award. You got the Clarence Big House Games Award. You got the John McClennan Award. Uh, this year's recipient was Damian Stoudemire for the Ben Job Award. Uh, for Big House Games, it was Coach uh, Ben McClellan from Northwestern. For uh, uh, Coach McClendon, it was jo- Joe Gallio from Merrimack. He received that, those awards. So those are the awards that go out every year. And we would uh, we used to have this big uh, big to do at the Final Fours every year. Now for the last three or four years, we have not had the big dinner, but the awards still go out. The people are still recognized, and then not only that, they recognize players also. Yes, so it's sir. Not just the coaches; it's the players. It, it, it's a great thing, and 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 people can read about it. It's, it's collegeinsiders dot com. And like I said, Joe Dwyer is the uh, he 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 started this thing, and he does an outstanding job. And uh, you you'll see the co- different committees. Uh, like I said, I'm on uh, the selection committee, and so I've been there for years. And like I said, we used to do the polls, uh, the weekly polls that a lot of people didn't know were out there. But we did the mid major polls, so it, it's great for college basketball. He's a great guy, and he puts a lot into it. And he's all—he's always like the swack and the meat. 
Well, and my hat's off to him. My hat is off to you, my friend, because just as always, you are a walking encyclopedia uh, full of energy, full of wisdom. And we truly, truly appreciate you. But we're going to have to uh, get you back on here, Coach, so we can continue going a little bit deeper. Right. We, and we're going to try to get Joe on here also. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Because we have actually, believe it or not, Coach, we have come to the end of today's episode, okay. man. And and. I, I hate to do it, but... But, the, Mike, the, anytime. I, I'm available anytime, Mike. Well, look, we thank you so much. Coach Van Petaway, basketball analyst for the Open Mic Broadcast Network, the Carlos Brown Show, and the Mike Prince Show. Man, just time just flies when this man is with us. We want to thank you all for joining in with us on tonight. Dr. Rusty Ponton, athletic director for the Grambling State Tigers. Of course, our back-end guest, the guru himself, Papa, Coach, Van Petaway. Thank our sponsors for joining in with us. Brass's Valley Schools Credit Union, the Prairie View Athletic Club, the Temple of Refuge Ministries, and so many more of you that I'm forgetting right now because I know I'm pressed up against the clock. Diva Skin Conditioner. Also want to thank the good people from the Farmers Insurance of Hempstead, Texas. Helping hands, lawn service, and you, the listener. The clock on the wall tells me I've got to go. I am the radio guy, Dr. Mike Prince. As always, you guys be blessed, and we'll see you on the other side.